Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, and this is my uh, Mind Basics lecture for my Philosophy of Mind class. And I'm going to lay out a bunch of uh, basic concepts, give you a rough overview of all the stuff we're going to cover, and sort of discuss some important philosophical distinctions that'll uh, frame out this discussion to let us dive into a bunch of details, articles, arguments, controversies, and positions um, during the semester. So what we're asking and what we're first, sort of the way we're going to frame this out to start is what's a mind and how do we know anything about it? So there's two different kinds of question here. And I'm going to distinguish between an ontological question and an epistemological question. So the ontological question in philosophy, ontology is the study of what sorts of things exist, or what sort of thing uh, is, it, what sorts of things are out there. You know, does does material substance exist? Does the universe exist? Does mind exist? Does God exist? So those kinds of big existential questions are uh, figure heavily in um, metaphysics and in the study or what philosophers call ontology. So the ontological questions about the mind then are just straight up what sort of thing is it? We're all pretty sure we have one but the question is what's the nature of it? What's it made of? Is it made of matter? Is it made of neurons? Is it made of some immaterial ghostly spirit stuff? That's a like legitimate question, and there's some sort of disagreement about the ultimate constituent nature of the stuff that comprises it. So along those lines, we, we are intimately familiar with other things like, well, I have beliefs. That seems to be one of the contents of my mind that's in there. That's one of the things I have, and my beliefs have this weird status. So... There's occurrent beliefs. Those are beliefs that I am thinking about right now. So if I reflect to myself that, um, you know, this building uh, weighs more than a car. Okay, that's a thing that I currently have a feeling of believing. So it's currently in my mind. But there's a bunch of other beliefs. Um, like take that one, that one that I just asserted. Uh, before I had said it, that was non-occurrent in your head. But now, probably, depending on the size of the building you're in and the size of the car you're in, now probably you're having the occurrent belief that the building you are in is heavier than a car. Um, so it was not occurrent before, and now it's occurrent. So it's come into being, and it is now occupying your mind. So that's an important distinction for us to think about the status, uh, the ontological status of beliefs and how they figure into this discussion about what minds are. And furthermore, you've got other things like memories, you've got personality, you've got your dispositions, you have your emotional tendencies, your habits, and so on. And those all seem to build up or, or amount to part of uh, what characterizes and makes your mind what it is. Whatever a mind is, it's got some relationship with all of those. So to figure out what it is, it's going to have to give some accounting of how of all of those connect up and how of all of those play a role here. Um, another very big issue, and perhaps the biggest issue we'll talk about all semester, is figuring out the nature of consciousness. So I've got whole lectures dedicated to uh, introducing the notion of consciousness, but for now I'm just going to direct your attention to this. Um, I'm having some uh, phenomenal or some personal experience right now, and that's different than if I were knocked out or unconscious from anesthesia or I'm dead asleep in a non-REM sleep. Um, I'm not conscious at that point, but right now I'm a conscious, I'm awake, and there are contents, there are things I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about cars and houses and lectures or whatever, um, and you have those too. So right now, from moment to moment, I'm experiencing this thing, consciousness. That's the notion or the idea, the concept of consciousness that we will focus most of our attention on this semester. That's different, say, than the way we'd use the word conscious when people say, oh, well, I became more conscious and now I'm recycling. Or um, I'm more, you know, where we mean something more like conscientious. Uh, conscientious. Or um, I'm trying to be conscious, uh, I'm trying to donate more money to charity. So you're there, you're sort of conflating or using the word conscious. Um, to connect up to moral conceptions. So when we talk about consciousness, we're going to talk about the subjective experience that you have when you're awake and when there's some contents that are occupying your mind. So 
what we what the ultimate nature of that thing is an important central ontological question for the for this course. Um, another example here is this diagram I've put up on the slide. This thing's known as a Necker cube. And one of the interesting things about this diagram is that you can willfully switch your, the contents of your consciousness from moment to moment. You can see that cube as if the um, the square that's down and left is the leading square that's near you, or you can sort of will yourself to flip it so that the square that's up and right is the leading square, it's the front edge of the square. So you can make this thing go from foreground to background and background to foreground for the two surfaces. So when you do that from second to second or moment to moment at my instruction or at your will, your consciousness has different contents. Um, so that's going to be one of these sort of examples of a kind of uh, to try to triangulate and get our put our finger on exactly what's going on when you're conscious of something. Uh, these sorts of optical illusions become really important in consciousness research when we're doing neuroscience and trying to understand well, what are the neural correlates of consciousness, for example. Um, what is going on neurologically in the brain when you're conscious of one of those faces or Necker cube versus the other one. Um, another question that figures largely here in the sort of theory about what the nature of this thing is, is we could also ask what's unconscious. You have a, you seem to have some subconscious or unconscious stuff going on. Um, and I'll, for now, I'm just going to say there are lots of things going on in your cognitive system that I, that you're not aware of. Um, they figure we know empirically that they have an impact on your thoughts or your beliefs or your out your behaviors or the sorts of things you say and do, um, but you may not be even be able to access, ac access them or uh, put bring them into consciousness. So what are those? What are what are the status of those subconscious contents and how do they play a role in consciousness? So any ontological account of what a mind is is going to have to capture or uh, include those two notions of consciousness and subconscious and give us an account of where and how those are emerging into the world. Uh, maybe a more familiar way of thinking of this ontological question is to you will be the you know the religious way of thinking about the the question the ontological question um, and the way that's always been put in those kinds of contexts the way you took you were taught at church or synagogue or wherever um, was this idea of having a soul. So we could just ask the question, do I have a soul? And for my purposes and in this in this course, I'm going to treat um, the question of having a soul as, as interchangeable with the question of having a mind. So uh, that may not be strictly fair to some people's use of the word soul. Um, some people have uh, non-personal uh, accounts of the soul. So if you go to, say, Eastern religious traditions, um, there's an idea that there's a sort of energy or life force, an impersonal uh, spiritual aspect of you that lives beyond the body, that transcends the body, that goes on and you know joins back up with the universal consciousness, or it transmits to another body, and it has some resemblance to your personal soul, but not uh, in others. So there are personal and non-personal accounts of the soul. In the West, most often with like American, Christian, Western notions, the idea is your soul is this collection, this nexus of all your feelings, your thoughts, your personality, um, your virtues, your vices, and it's in virtue of the properties of your soul that you'll go into heaven or you don't go to heaven. And going to heaven then, there's some continuity of your soul exists in this other realm or this other place. It goes on beyond your body. So I'm going to come back to the question about mind, brain, or soul, brain existence with and without bodies. So just to introduce those notions and get us sort of thinking about the distinctions here. Um, about, uh, about, about the differences, and I'll be using soul more or less interchangeably with the notion of mind, but we can talk about um, impersonal or non-personal accounts of the soul. Uh, okay, so more on the question of ontology, what's it made of? Well, we can make this basic distinction. Um, there are theories that say minds are made of material stuff, that's the physical stuff and the reality, uh, the periodic table of elements stuff that you're most familiar with. So material objects like your car, like hydrogen, um, you know, like a jar of peanut butter, 
They occupy a discrete segment of space and time. There is a spatial region that they uh, uh, occupy, and there's a temporal region that they occupy. So, um, you know, the, the car you own now wasn't always the matter that makes up your car wasn't always in that car shape. It was mined and made into steel. Um, so the atoms that made up your car were once buried deep in a mountain somewhere and then mined and refined and created into steel. And the plastic parts were made out of polymers and plastics and, and other um, uh, chemistry. And so the atoms and molecules were converted from one form into another and then it rolls off the Toyota assembly line and there's the Toyota, the one, the Toyota Celica that you own. And that thing, you know, serves you faithfully for 15 years and then it dies and you take it to the junkyard and you sell it for 200 bucks and then they smash it and they refine it and they tear it apart and they recycle all the material. Okay, so your car existed for that discrete segment of space and time, even though the matter went on and got became constituent parts of other things. Okay, so material objects then, and one of the answers, one of the ways to answer the question, what's a mind, is to say it's a material thing. And it has uh, a discrete, distinct, spatial, temporal uh, occupation that it uh, fulfills. Versus immaterial concepts, uh, of the soul or of the mind are ones that assert that the mind is non-spatial or at least non-temporal. So any kind of a ghost account, or maybe these are more hybrid accounts, but uh, take the more um, classic Western American Christian view about the soul that transcends the death of the body. Now, uh, American Christians are split on this. Uh, many of them actually think that the resurrection into heaven includes a bodily resurrection, so that your reappearance in the afterlife is a reappearance with your body. Uh, but there's other uh, religious folks, and there's other American Christians, for example, which we some of us are more, more familiar with, who think that um, that the that the uh, their continuity into the next world or into the next life leaves this body behind and there's your soul goes on, your immaterial essence goes on to this other nature of existence. So you might ask this question, well, what's a ghost then? Uh, and I looked it up today, really interesting that uh, I figured it was pretty high, but uh, according to a Gallup poll recently, 32% of Americans believe in ghosts. Um, about 10% of them are really scared of them, which is a little bit more than people who are scared of zombies. Uh, it turns out that people's fear of these things goes up and down, and their belief in it goes up and down depending on TV shows. So Ghost Hunters, apparently, according to the Gallup poll, has been responsible for spiking a lot of Americans' beliefs in ghosts. Um, so ghosts are weird because they have some quasi-manifestation -manif as a physical thing because you can see it perhaps with your eyes, so there's a spooky, you know, sheet coming down the hall, um, but it goes through the wall or it goes through the floor or it disappears. It does some weird contra physical thing. So ghosts have these weird hybrid status. Uh, I can't help it here. I'm going to have to uh, sort of uh, draw some lines. Uh, it's an interesting side discussion we hate we should have, but I don't think it, any. I don't think ghosts exist. Uh, but if you do, or if you are going to try to build an informed idea about what the nature of mind is, then I have a bunch of questions about, and you should start thinking about, okay, well, if minds are real things, then what's their relationship uh, to other sorts of things that exist in the world? And if you think ghosts exist, okay, is that somebody's mind that's now transcended or left their bodies and it persists beyond the grave and has this other status? Like, what's the philosophical status of that and how can we really make sense of all that? And I think we actually can't, but that's a bigger discussion to have on the side. Um, okay, so another ontological question, central ontological question to ask is, what do minds have to do with brains? And I'm not using those two terms the same. So the brain is this, you know, two and a half pound um, gelatinous organ uh, of meat that's inside your skull. That's got, you know, 83 billion neurons in it. That's your brain. And obviously one of the things we've got to worry about in a philosophy of mind class is whatever a mind is, it's going to have to give some accounting of what's relationship to brains. Brains clearly have something, some role to play uh, in explaining what minds are. Because 
Uh, we can remove parts of your brain and you cease to be able to think about or have certain kinds of thoughts or certain aspects or functions or modules or features of your mind go away. So there seems to be some very intimate connection between those two. So any good theory of mind is going to have to say something about the anchoring or the connection or the emergence or the identity of um, minds and brains. So big question for this course is how are minds and brains related? Is the mind identical to the brain? Does the mind emerge from some brain functions? Um, can a mind exist independent from a brain? And that's sort of the ghost question I was asking a minute ago. And I will just refer you here to one of my published papers um, called Against the Immort Immortality of the Soul. Go take a look at that to read up and sort of explore the question in more depth and background, that sort of context. Um, and there I talk about this position. I argue for this thesis. I argue, argue for dependency. I don't see any way around this conclusion. It seems very clear from all the evidence we have that minds depend upon brains to exist. Um, and that is to say, without a brain, there's no mind. And I think all of the neuroscience research, I think you're drinking coffee, I think uh, motorcycle accidents without a helmet, I think there's all this evidence where we can show that altering the brain with chemistry, with caffeine, with LSD, or changing the brain with a stroke, or a, 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 you know, a, a serious blow to the head, or an aneurysm, all point to the conclusion that whatever a mind is, the features, the functions, the uh, capacities that we associate with the term mind all depend upon a well-functioning brain uh, to occur, to happen to exist. So that when you take the brain away, um, when you know um, the, a, a body decays in the grave and enough brain function has gone or somebody uh, dies on the operating room table and they become brain dead, uh, when enough of those brain functions are gone, the mind functions are gone. So I give a much more detailed and robust defense of that conclusion in that paper, which you might find interesting. I'm going to put that as background reading for the course. I'm not making it required reading for us to consider. Um, and notice, to, to make an asymmetry clear here, the other direction of dependency doesn't isn't true. That is... Um, Minds are dependent upon brains to exist, but brains are not dependent upon minds to exist. So persistent vegetative state cases of somebody who's in a coma um, where they've got ser serious brain damage um, shows that, say, the brain still exists, but the, but the mind no longer is there. Or at least conventional wisdom, we usually feel like in some of these kinds of cases where there's been extreme uh, brain damage or extreme, extreme disruption of brain functions enough that we feel like the person, um, the personality, the beliefs, the, the, the person that we, that we associated with that brain's function is no longer there. The mind is gone even though the brain still uh, persists. So dependency only goes, is, is asymmetric in this case. Okay, so now on the expanding the notion of ontological theories about what the nature of mind is, um, we're going to consider a couple of different kinds of dualist theories. So a substance dualist theory of mind is the view that minds and bodies exist. They're different. They're independent substances. They're autonomous. They can be separated, but they also happen to be conjoined. So you both you have both a physical or material body, and you have a, a an immaterial. Uh, mind, and they happen to be conjoined during your life, um, but they can be separated or they're distinct, uh, discrete substances or different things. That's Descartes, and that's also probably most familiar with this kind of conventional uh, American Western idea about the status of your mind and its relationship to your body. So that's substance dualism. Another less familiar position is called property dualism. This comes up in the 20th century. There's still some adherents. There's still some people who adopt this view in philosophy of mind. And these folks will say they don't hold the hard, the strong view about minds and brains being different substances that necessarily can be separated. In fact, they might even agree with my dependency thesis claim, but they will say that minds and bodies have two different kinds of irreducible properties. So you describe minds one way and you describe brains another way, and those can't be exchanged or translated or um, uh, reduced one to the other. 
uh, so there's there's um, two sets of descriptions that are true of the same thing in the world. Um, and these positions come out to be uh, either interactionist positions or epiphenomenalist positions. And there's a range of ways to spell out the details here, but I'll just point to those, I'll just say that for now. So property dualism is the, is the idea that there are two different kinds of properties and two different, different descriptions that can capture what a mind is, what a brain is, but they can't be uh, reduced to each other. So they have to stay separate as descriptions, as properties. Um, uh, so if there's dualist positions, then there must be monist positions. And, and a monist position, a monist ontological position about mind is just to say that there's only one kind of substance, and that leaves us two options. Um, they might be what's known as idealist theories of mind, um, uh, idealist monist positions, which just says minds or ideas are the only things that exist. There's nothing physical, material, or nothing beyond mind. And if you've taken one of our history of philosophy courses, you will encounter uh, Berkeley, you will encounter Leibniz, um, you'll encounter some famous idealists in the history of philosophy, those two being two of the biggest. Um, and they arrive at the, the conclusion, the idealist conclusion, by different routes, but they both end up arguing that mind is the only thing that exists. There is no, there is nothing else in the, in the universe. There's no other ontological um, there's, there's no other ontological categories. And then more modern versions we'll get, uh, we'll see later, we'll get uh, uh, an article and some arguments from David Chalmers, who's a, a, a currently uh, one of the top philosophers of mind, is at the New York, uh, NYU, um, and he's going to argue for some idealist style positions that he calls panpsychist or pan protopsychist, and those get uh, those are getting some more attention. They're they're in the minority view, but panpsychism is a view that's still alive in modern philosophy of uh, of mind. Um, on the other side, then, of monist ontological views is physicalist, and that's to say, predictably, that everything that exists, including minds, is ultimately physical. There's nothing else except physical substance out there. Um, so an exa examples of people we're going to look at this semester who hold that kind of view, Daniel Dennett, um, Stanislaus Dehaene, Jesse Prinz, uh, we'll look at several, we're going to look at a lot of neuroscientists, and they all have basically physicalist uh, assumptions about the ultimate nature of everything that exists and the ultimate nature of consciousness or mind is, is a physical. It's physical stuff, uh, spatial, temporal, made of the periodic table kinds of physical stuff. Um, 20th century versions of this, we won't go into this, but uh, behaviorism with Gilbert Ryle was one of the views earlier in the 20th century that identified mind with behavior, which is a physical phenomena. There's also identity theories, which hold that the mind is a type of physical thing. Um, there's functionalist theories, which we're really going to pick up the ball with those and run. So functionalist theories are physicalist theories. They ultimately, they think that the ultimate nature of mind and everything else is physical, typically. But they end up abstracting away from the particular uh, construction of human brains and say, well, actually, minds are collections of functions. They're built from matter, typically, but it's really the functional causal components that make the difference here. It need not be made of neurons or anything in particular. It's what matters is having these certain functional uh, equivalence that creates uh, mind or that captures what the mind is. And I'll have lots more to say about what functionalism is later in the semester. Another view we'll look at that's a bit uh, more extreme, a physicalist view, is called eliminative materialism. Um, and to put it really shortly, uh, eliminative materialists, they eliminate things. So they argue that lots of the ideas or concepts or labels that we've given to uh, mind and mind stuff um, actually don't hold up under scrutiny and they just disappear when you start looking at them. Once you start trying to figure out what a belief is, for example, or maybe what a soul is, or maybe what ego, or maybe what will is, um, it actually kind of disappears in front of us. It just evaporates in our hands. Uh, it turns out, like in the history of science, turned out not to be a thing, like phlogiston, or Elan Vital, or one of these other um, or the ether, one of these other concepts that came up in the history of science that we thought gave us some insight into the, it gave us 
a description of some actual ontological thing that was out there, but it turns out the concept was just bankrupt and it didn't uh, survive empirical scientific investigation. So eliminative materialists often will jettison many of our what they think are spooky or outdated uh, mind terms in favor of a more um, empirically responsible scientific um, uh, account that may or may not uh, allow this old uh, antique concept into the new um, uh, taxonomy. Now I'm going to spend a good bit of time in this course talking about artificial intelligence because it's partly one of the topics that's close to my heart, but it also gives us an opportunity, a really cool opportunity, to triangulate on what the nature of mind is. And just by asking this one question, can a non-human, non-meat, non-brain system have a mind? And just trying to answer that question just unfolds and opens up a whole area of inquiry here and gives us a bunch of uh, neat ideas in trying to figure out and, and answer, figure out what a good theory of mind is. Um, along those lines and deeper into those details, and usually artificial intelligence researchers, again, are monists, uh, they're physicalists, and a connectionism is a theory within first started in computer science, but now has taken over lots of the discussions in philosophy of mind. Uh, and connectionists say, a bit like functionalists, they're abstracting away from the messy meat details of brains. And a connectionist will say, well, what, a, what really is important about the nature of mind is the huge number of parallel, distributed, plastic, changeable network connections that the neurons make up. So you've got 83 billion neurons in your brain with five to roughly 50,000 dendritic connections each. So these are electrical and chemical synapses. Um, and it's what matters here is the firing of the connection patterns across the cascading across all of that cortex of brain tissue. So connectionists say, okay, let's build that artificially, let's get rid of the meat, let's get rid of the organs, and let's see if we can simulate or build some simple versions of that with just a connectionist network, and we'll do it in a computer, or do it in a machine, and we'll mimic some of the basic functions of how neurons work, and out of that, maybe, if they're ambitious, the, the idea is that we'll emerge some kind of proto-mind or some sort of mind will come out of building the right kind of connectionist network. So that's some really cool research, really timely, and it's uh, it's relevant to all of our lives because lots of the stuff you're doing on your phone is dependent directly upon connectionist research and AI, uh, Silicon Valley AI stuff. So we'll look at we'll take a dive into that and take a look at that in this course, and then the other sort of uh, approach to this question that's dear to my heart and the one that I think is going to give us the most um, quick insight into get us up to speed with what's happening in this uh, discipline about what the nature of mind is, is what Patricia Kirk Churchland called neurophilosophy. Uh, she coined the term, she wrote the first book, and she sort of created a whole new discipline. And the idea is we're going to take the best analytic skills of conceptual clarification from philosophy and combine it with the cutting edge neuroscience research about what the nature of consciousness is and we'll devise the best theory of what a mind is by you know combining those two disciplines. So Patricia Churchland who was at UC San Diego and then Yale is sort of the best example of somebody doing that kind of work and um, so is Dennett and some of these other people. We're going to read are actually neuroscientists. We'll be reading some actual neuroscience research. So we're going to uh, sort of pursue or adopt that approach uh, to see if we can figure out what the nature of consciousness is. Okay, so that's all about ontology. Um, the other question is how do we know about minds? Or what can we know about the minds? And that's epistemology. So epistemology is the study of knowledge. And now the question is, uh, how is it, whatever minds are, how is it that we get access to them? How do we understand what they are? Um, what is the nature of our uh, window into them? The first obvious answer, the one that philosophers have been you know, leaning heavily on for, for eons, for centuries, is introspection. So the term here then captures what it is um, when you look in to your own thoughts and you're aware of your own thoughts. So you introspect your own thoughts, whereas you extrospect, if you will, uh, that there's a tree outside. So you have, we think, and certainly Descartes thought so, we're going to look at 
Descartes as our consummate example of an introspectionist, um, we have immediate direct access to the contents of our own minds and our own beliefs. And I can't do that with anybody else's. So at best I can ask you what your thoughts are and you can tell me about them with language, but that's just me hearing words. I have a different kind of immediate access to my own thoughts uh, that are different than my words and I don't have introspective access to your the existence of your mind. Which brings us to the problem of other minds, which uh, has been kind of a a, a, a a fixture in the discussion of philosophy of mind for centuries. Um, I am directly and immediately confronted with my own mind, and we're going to see that classic argument from Descartes, but what about other people's minds? Do those exist? Are they out there? It seems like they are, but the only way to get to them um, at best, what I can do is I observe your behavior and I make an inference that there's a mind behind the physical observable behavior I see, but I can't be sure about the existence of your mind the way I'm sure about my own mind. So the status of other minds is weird and kind of, um, it's, it's a sort of a conundrum for uh, the philosopher because you have a kind of, there's an immediacy and an incorrigibility or an assurance about your own existence that's not... Um, available to you about other minds in the world. So that argument is often called the argument by analogy. The argument that gets us out of the problem of other minds is called the argument by analogy and I figure by analogy that your mind is the cause of your behavior just as my mind is the cause of my behavior. My best explanation and the analogy I can run here is that um, you are to your, uh, you know, your mind is to your behavior what my mind is to my behavior. So I infer there must be a mind there even though I can't get immediate access to it. Um, the alternative here to uh, surmounting the problem of other minds is what's called solipsism. And this position is just to say that my mind is the only thing that exists in the world. And you'll see that Descartes flirts with and worries about this trap for a moment in the uh, meditations. It may be that you can't escape the sort of prison cell of this assurance of your own mind's existence and get out to know about others. Uh, we won't be severely skeptical about that in this class, but that is in the background and that's part of the history of this uh, philosophical question. So by uh, implication then we ask this question, how do we know minds? Well, the approach generally we're going to take in this course is that you introspect as well as you can. And we're going to find out in the first few weeks in the first module about introspection that introspection is not very reliable. It's not trustworthy. Um, you don't know your own mind as well as you think you do. But it's all we've got. Um, and then on the outside, what we do is we devise experimental and empirical measures of behavior and brains. So we're going to do this kind of combination of uh, introspection and neurophilosophy to figure out what the nature of mind is and sort of bootstrap our way up with empirical research, which is on the outside, and um, you know, introspective research, which is on your inside, and we build up and, and tease out fill out an account of what a mind is. Okay, so summary here then, we've talked about ontology. That's the question of what kind of a thing is a mind, what's it's made of. And we've talked about dualist and monist theories. We're going to consider several of these in the course of the semester. And then we've considered this knowledge question about epistemology. How do we know minds? We know them by introspection. We know them by analogy. We know them by empirical investigation with neuroscience. Um, and behavioral psychology, and we're going to see lots of that research in the course of the semester. Um, and we're going to focus heavily in this course on the question about consciousness. Uh, namely, we mean what is the nature and source of this nexus of experience that I'm having in my head right now as I think, as I listen, as I daydream, as I remember, as I'm having these conscious experiences. What's going on with that? How does that work? How is that produced by a brain? How does that come into the world? What's, what's the best way to theoretically understand that? Um, we've raised this question, and we're going to explore it much further, about what the relationship between minds and brains are. And then finally here, for just your, your notes or for a short list, here's a, a kind of outline of all of the more detailed uh, concepts, terms, and um, ideas that we've introduced in this lecture.